Welcome, Joe. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and Matt was not joking. These pages are scented. Um, and I think on the train commuting when I was reading this book, preparing for today, I made everyone's commute that much better on the stinky trains. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. So one question I want to start off with, Joe, is what is the proper way to fragrant yourself? Do you spritz on the wrists? Do you sort of walk into a cloud of scent? Well, I think you can do it any way you want, but actually, this is the best way to wear a fragrance. So that really is, I know you're all going, what? A brush for fragrance? A brush, if you take a paintbrush and you, sp you spray yourself with fragrance and then take the paintbrush and then brush it all over your body, it's just like painting your body with fragrance, not color. And it, and it scoops all of the fragrance and dries it. And it is, honestly, it's one of the best ways to wear fragrance. And then you can wear two or three together. So you can put palmello all over your body and then take a little gardenia and just pop it behind your ears. Or if you're a man, you can run some great cologne down the back of your legs and be creative with fragrance. There you go. You can have it. Oh, wow. Thank you. Brush. I'm going to go paint myself later. <laughs> um, so... This book, I was telling Joe backstage, this book was absolutely incredible. I literally wept, I laughed. My husband was making fun of me a lot. He was like, what are you reading? It's like, it's so good. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think one of the things that really stands out about your story, especially this book as a reader, is that it has such a beautiful narrative. And you've really done a beautiful job of sort of making it feel like a movie. Oh, thank you, thank you. It, it, I really, I wrote this book like I create a bottle of fragrance. And when I create a bottle of fragrance, I empty everything I feel into that bottle. And when it's finished, I feel empty. And when I wrote this book, that's exactly, I got to the, well, I got tw twice all the way through it, I put it down because it was, there were places I went that were quite painful. And I thought, I don't want to finish this, I can't do it. And then I'd pick it up again, and I'd write another chapter, and then I'd think, okay, I'm going to finish it. So when I got to the end page, it was like, wow, I did it. And I felt so proud. And what was the most challenging thing about writing this book? Was it sort of keeping on a strict schedule from a logistics standpoint, or was it more about sort of diving into some of those darker memories? Uh, do you know what? I'm, really, I'm a really, surprisingly, a driven person. And when I have a target and I have to deliver at something on that day, I always deliver it. I think the most difficult thing was my childhood, was reliving moments in my childhood. My parents um, and all my family are now passed away. So it was reliving some of those memories. And when you write a book, your memories don't come out in the order that it happened. And so I would remember at midnight some of the things and the emotions and out it would all come. So that was the toughest part. And But what the most wonderful bit, was I fell in love with my mum and dad all over again. And I realised, actually, as a parent now, it's not the easiest job. And they really did their best. And, you know, my dad was this amazing, creative a artist. character. He was a character. <laughs> uh, and my mum, you know, she really struggled. She really struggled, but she was an incredibly brilliant woman. And um, I fell in love with them both again, and that was a real joy. Oh, you're going to make me cry oh, again, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. And there was another big character in this book that was an influence in your upbringing and your sort of uh, romance with fragrance, Madame Lubadi. She was some woman. She was, <laughs> uh, she was six foot two, very beautiful. Uh, she wore a white lab coat, fishnet tights, blood red lipstick, pixie blonde hair. And she, her real name was Doris Hilda, but she had created this whole life for herself and she was known as the Countess Labati. She was brilliant with skin, and she was brilliant with fragrance, and I would spend so much of my young childhood in the laboratory with her. But she had this very, very, very deep voice like that, and, I, and she would say, Joe, and I'd look up, and I was just in awe of this woman. But she was the one that opened the world of cosmetics for me, and a love that I still have today, and the respect of a laboratory, the respect of... Um, how you put a face cream together. And that brings me to my next question. 
is in the book, there were so many really cool scenes of, so one of the things that Joe says in the book is that scent, image follows the scent, right? So yeah. all of these scenes of you sort of walking on the sidewalk to a beautiful cafe or in Goss, France, and the story of Pamela on the beach and Turks and Caicos and all of these really cool stories about how she just had all these different notes um, and how your sight and your taste sort of comes into play. How does that happen? I mean... I'm dyslexic. And so dyslexics don't... It, that isn't a disability to have dyslexia. It's just the ability to think differently. Yeah. So when I create fragrance... And I've never done it any differently, so I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't know how to do it in a conventional fashion. So when I create fragrance, I look at something... And I close my eyes and then I open my eyes and I look at the whole scene from Pomelo, the beach that in the Turks and Caicos. And I was walking up the beach and I, it was at a time when I'd left Joe Malone and I had a five-year time where I hadn't created anything and then I decided I was going to come back again. So I'm walking up the beach, I haven't created a fragrance and I thought the ability had left me. And I saw a stingray swimming along beside me in the water. It was so beautiful. And I walked up the beach and came back and I realised creativity is mimics you and it stands beside you. So I looked around the whole of the beach, from the white rolled towels to the fizzy water, to the broth that was cooking, to the white sand with the sand dollars, and I took a fragrant note and, uh, and attached it to every piece of the memory and then locked Pomelo all back together again. And it's, for me, it's one of the most natural things in the world. So when I try and do it in a conventional fashion, I end up with some pretty horrible fragrances. <laughs> but, the, but every time I stay true to the integrity and the creativity, it comes out like pomelo. It's incredible. I mean, the sense you've come up with and really the fact that you are this huge, huge icon. What would you say if you could go back to you as a little girl? Is there anything that you would tell her? I would say... It's funny, I don't see myself as an icon, I really don't. I see myself as a really hard-working person who's been really blessed twice in their life to build and create fragrance. But I think I'd say to her, you know what, don't be in such a hurry to get to your destination. And I think in the younger part of my life, I was always so desperate to turn the page and get to the next level, I forgot to enjoy the moment. And as I've got older, I really see and really treasure those moments. So it would be... Don't be in such a hurry because you will get there. And really trust your instinct because... Uh, it, it, trust your instinct in creativity. Trust your instinct in people. And when I was much younger, I thought everybody was a good person. You know, and as we get older, we realise that's not true, is it? Um, so, you know, just, take a, just trust that gut. Trust your instinct because it will serve you well. Yeah, that scene of you as a little girl at the frosted window and... Sort of, can you tell the audience a little bit about that scene from the book? I, I remember. So I grew up in a little two up, two down. And in England, you call it a council estate, but it's like your projects. So it was subsidised housing. And I worked from the age of 11. It was really up to me to check that there was the next meal in the fridge to feed our family. And it was, it, you know, there were moments where that was really, really tough. And I remember one day being upstairs in my bedroom and we had no central heating and it was snowy outside. And the inside of my window had iced up. And I remember standing there and taking my finger and cutting through the ice and thinking, I don't want to live like this for the rest of my life. I don't want to live in fear of where we're going to get the next meal, in fear whether my mum and dad are going to be there and I don't want to live like this, and I'm determined I will get myself out of this. And, it, and I often remember, that's why I put it in the book as well, because it's a, it was a real moment where this little girl called out to life and said, I refuse to live like this. And I want to read a passage from your book. Um, this was right after uh, Joe Malone had been uh, sold, and uh, you were in New York City here in Central Park in winter. Um, and it says, the wind started to chill the back of my neck. Winter was on its way, and I smiled. I remembered me as a little girl standing at my frosted window, not wanting to feel the cold and vowing never to live in struggle ever, ever again. 
And now there I was in a position where I would never have to worry about money again. I felt a huge swell of emotion, not only because I felt gratitude of happiness, but because I felt my own pride in that little girl who had never given up on her dream. And Maybe in the end, that's the only pride worth chasing. That gives me goosebumps, guys, come on. <laughs> like, it, it's just incredible. I walked, I walked past that, that spot the other day in the park and I'm gonna go in the weekend and I'm gonna go and stand in. And I remember just signing the deal and um, we'd arrived in the city to sign the biggest deal of my lifetime and a certain airline had lost my case so I was standing in a track suit. And, and it, was, it was ironic just to look at life and see how far I'd come and how far I still had to go. It was as though the dream had um, just begun. And I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, your new brand, Joe Loves. And when you sort of spoke now about how life comes full circle and how funny life is, um, I love, love, love that you, the, the Joe Love store is now at the deli you worked at as a young girl. It was, so at 16 years old, I had my first job in a flower shop and I got fired because I tipped a bucket of water over somebody. And there were two little shops in the street that were owned by the same man called Justin DeBlanc. And one was a deli and one was a flower shop. And I was sent up to the deli to work, which was number 42 Elizabeth Street. And it was a really happy time and I worked really hard, but I was fired again because I gave a tramp a smoked salmon sandwich. So I was fired twice in the space of a few months. That's a homeless person, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, and for my 49th birthday, I was looking for a home for Joe Loves, and I couldn't find it. My husband gave me this little box, and I thought it was diamonds, as you do, with a little box if I, your husband gives it to you. <laughs> and I opened it. It was a key, and I can't drive, so I knew it wasn't a car, and I love my house. And he said, go be a shopkeeper again, Joe, because you're an absolute nightmare being at home. <laughs> And I said, well, where is it? And it was 42 Elizabeth Street. So I hit my life, brought me full circle. And life has often done that with me, actually. It's brought me right back to where I first started. And so on my birthday, we sat on the front doorstep with a cup of coffee and a bacon sandwich. And I walked into this shop and I felt life say, you will change the world again in this place. And I'm giving it my best shot. <laughs> well, if... Pomelo, your new fragrance, is any indication of that. I can guarantee you that's already happening. <laughs> Thank you. Because it smells amazing. And, um, you know, one of the other things I'd like to talk about is sort of the evolution of technology in the beauty industry and the Joe Loves Tapas Bar. Mm. Can you sort of talk a little bit about how you think technology and social media has sort of impacted the beauty industries in your five years since? Well, I'm, I'm probably the least technical person. I, I can't even turn on a computer. I can just about use my iPhone. But I have a team, thank goodness, that can do it. I can tweet. I do my own tweets, by the way. I can tweet myself. But if you, 25 years ago, when you had a new product, you would write a press release, and it would be sent out, and you'd wait a month to see whether anyone was going to write about it. Now, you send a press release, and it can go around the globe within five minutes. I mean, it, the world is so different. But your message has to be consistent. It has to be strong. You have to stay on brand. Any picture you post, any tweet, anything has to link back in and has to really follow the soul of your brand and who you really are. And uh, one little chink, and it, and it can all unravel very, very quickly. So you have to make sure that you keep momentum and stability in everything that you do. Um, the tapas bar that you mentioned, is I wanted to, so this Joe Loves is all about everything I love. It's not about a marketing plan, it's not about the in thing, it's about everything I love. And I love tapas bars. <laughs> so well. I was sitting there one day and I was thinking, what can I do? How can I make it different? And I sat there and came up with this concept that I would create a tapas bar for your nose. And that's exactly what I did. So it looks like this huge red glass J and it looks just like a tapas bar. You sit there in little stores with little hooks for your handbags or your umbrella. And you have four courses of tapas for your nose. So your shower gel comes from cocktail shakers. Your body lotion from Volute guns. And we take big paintbrushes and paint you. Your bath cologne appears from hot steaming tagines. And we lift all the little cotton wool balls up with chopsticks. So everything is about imagination. And we call it the first kiss. Because who remembers their first kiss here? 
No one fib. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, everybody remembers their first kiss. And so when you kiss a brand for the first time and it stays with you, that's what brings the consumer back time and time again, that relationship that is formed. And so tapas is, we don't charge for it. It's free of charge. You sit, you enjoy, you bring your mom, your grandmother, your friends, whoever you want, and you sit and you enjoy four courses of tapas and we kiss you for the first time. And when is that opening in New York? Uh, 2017. Cannot wait. <laughs> Well, I think we're going to hand it over to some audience Q&A. Questions? Hi, Joe. How are you? Hi. I noticed at the end of your book you have a face facial yogurt recipe. Is yep. there any other DIY recipes that you live by for beauty? Um, that, by the way, that mask, is the, it, cost, it will cost you literally pennies, and it's the best face mask to cleanse your skin in the whole world, so it really is worth doing. Um, some of the other tips, I still make my own cosmetics for my skin. I did a year's chemotherapy, and so my skin really reacts to everything I put onto it. So anything like jojoba, avocado, wheat germ, vitamin E, all those oils, you know, blending them together and really giving your skin a really good massage, always working in an upward, upward movement on your face, using the soft tissue of your fingertips and working up in circular movements and then taking a lovely warm towel, just putting it all over your skin so it heats the skin, and then give it another massage. And what it does, it gets all the oxygen moving in your skin, and your skin starts to get the circulation, and it looks healthy. So it's a really, really easy thing to do. Hi, how are you? I'm here. Oh, sorry. Um, I really think that uh, writing is such like an intimate medium, and um, I think that's just so brave for you to put your story um, out to the world. So I was wondering, what, when did you decide that this was the right time to write? It's such a, a, a good question. I've been asked it a lot as well. Um, can I also say, because I'm dyslexic, I did have a ghostwriter who was one of my dearest friends, Steve, and he was known as the book husband. Um, and he helped me, but we sat for 10 hours every single day in the apartment where I built, uh, built the first business. And, um, and I forgot what your, your other question was because I wandered off, sorry. Oh, like when did you decide that this was the right time? Oh, to the right time, story? exactly. So I was asked a lot of times, you know, will you write the story? Will you write the story? And I didn't feel ready. I didn't feel ready to unpack my memories. I didn't feel like ready to... And I didn't feel the story had that point where I was standing on the mountainside. So the five years when I had no business to run and nothing, that was the perfect time to write a story. But emotionally, I was in the lowest state I can remember. And you can't end a book being, being down there. You want to end that book when you're standing on that mountainside. And so when I found out that I was being inaugurated into the Hall of Fame as a shopkeeper, it's like, that's my mountainside. I'm ready to do it now. Um, which is why the, the book ends on that, on that point. Hey, we have Joe. one more question. Um, so I was wondering, um, where is the oddest place you've ever discovered a scent? I've had lots of odd places where I've created scent. And, and sometimes I get my best ideas as I'm just sitting in a coffee shop. But oh, I don't know about odd. I think the most magical moment for me was I ride horses a lot and I go to Montana every year. And it was at a time when I, I lost my identity of who Joe really was. And I felt very lost. And I took my horse, Josie, up on the top of a mountain very early one morning. And it was just about to start to rain. And all the wild sage was really strong in the air. And I could smell. I got off the horse and I put my head into her neck. And I could smell her and her mane and the leather of the saddle. I could smell a crackling log fire. And I looked out. And there was this purple haze. And I created a fragrance called Smoke Plum and Leather. And it was the most... Uh, and when I smell that fragrance and I close my eyes, I'm back standing by JC up on the top of the mountain. I mean... <laughs> just drop your mic right there, Joe. <laughs> She's a be beautiful horse as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you so, so, so much for being here today. And I cannot wait until you open your Joe Love store in 2017 here in New York. Remus will come and I'll paint you. We'll give you tapas. Yes. We'll do New tapas York tapas. Of all kinds of tapas. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone here, too.